Welcome to Learning Through Technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast brought to you by STS Education. We strive to be the bridge that connects communities of educators so that they can fulfill the promise of learning through technology. Join us every other week as we connect with education leaders who share their deep experience with the education and technology topics you are grappling with in your own schools and districts. Each interview is designed to bring you tangible ideas you can start using tomorrow. I'm Alex Inman, the founder of Educational Collaborators. And I'm Bob Sabruti, founder of the Edutech Group. Welcome to the show. Alex, today we have Dr. Talisa Dixon, who I have met on occasion through my wife, who is a superintendent with Dr. Dixon, Talisa, as she has told us to call her because she's a friend of ours. And she's retired from Columbus City Schools. So today's topic is like, what's retirement like, where to travel, what we're going to have for dinner. <laughs> like, that's what we're going to talk about, right? I mean, yes. Well, honestly, it'll probably be more interesting than whatever we tried to do in our show anyway. So first off, she's retired. So the cool part is now we can ask a superintendent the kinds of questions that you don't think you can get a straight answer from somebody who's reporting to a board. So we're totally asking about those things. Oh, so many questions now. Oh, yes. The other thing, too, is you know that I love community initiatives, right? To me, they're so powerful. Her resume is filled with amazing community partnership programs. And so we definitely need to ask her about that. But we're going to ask her about being retired too, right? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We welcome a powerhouse to the studio today, Dr. Talisa Dixon. With an expansive career in education, Dr. Dixon has spent the last 28 years climbing the ranks from social studies teacher all the way to superintendent at Columbus City Schools. It was a superintendent that Talisa became a beacon of light to students, colleagues, and other educators. In this role, she has helped over 600 students attend college tuition-free, and her role in the Columbus Promise Initiative has helped students prepare for careers in science, medicine, and art. Talisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. We are so glad to have you. So let's start a little bit with you. You've recently retired after a very long and distinguished career in education. What sort of lessons have you learned about the state of education in that time? Oh, wow. That's a great question, Alex. Well, one, so much has changed to when I started years ago. And primarily, I think accountability would be one. I mean, accountability has really changed the game and has really changed the role of administrators. How so? More accountability, less accountability? Oh, more accountability, especially building level principles. Probably when you and I were in school, your assistant principals or your principals really were safety managers in a sense, right? They wanted to make sure that climate and culture of the school was safe to learn. Things have evolved that principals really had to move into that educational role and really be an instructional leader. So not only do they have to make sure that your schools are safe and secure, but make sure learning takes place, make sure teachers have quality professional development and that parents are more involved, it has really changed the gamut for all schools across the country. So first off, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing, especially when you're talking about accountability, because you want to make sure that all students are being successful in your school districts. And I don't know if we had all great measures that really accounted for all students, but now... Hey, they gave Bob a degree in chemical engineering, so <laughs> clearly... Accountability has changed. <laughs> She's talking about high school, Alex, and I barely graduated. Well, they, they graduated you. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, do you remember back when the No Child Left Behind? Remember that initiative? That initiative really changed the game for um, school districts across the country. They wanted to make sure, again, all students were given an opportunity to excel in schools. And if not, to give districts the opportunity to get some funding kind of help make sure that those students have what they needed. So, Felice, I have a question about, so I haven't heard No Child Left Behind in a while, and I've been in schools now for, it'll be 20 years. This is my 20th school year working in schools. I started very young, and that was a term used a lot early on in my career. So I'm interested, do you think that that was helpful? You sounded positive towards it, because sometimes I've heard negative connotation, and a lot of times I hear, these days, it seems like negative connotation towards legislation or mandate. So what did you think about the No Child Left Behind? Yeah, I think at that time that it was 
good. I would think it was good for school districts across the country because I think we had a lot of students and data showed us some students were falling through the cracks. So that mandate just really allowed school districts to really focus on all learners. Now, some people say that those are unfunded mandates and that sense of accountability, school districts didn't have the resources they need because schools are funded very differently across the United States. So yes, you can have accountability measures, but if you don't have the funding to support providing students what they need, then that could be a concern for districts across the country. But at the time, it was a great thing, I believe. Okay. Yes. So you actually mentioned funding earlier. So did more funding come as a result of the results that came from the accountability? It depended on the state, but they did give school districts resources to help those students that were identified and need more more support. But again, school districts are funded very differently across each state. So, and that is, that's another conversation about school funding that needs to be addressed across the country. Yeah. Absolutely. So did the roles change? So when the accountability increased from like No Child Left Behind and moving forward, you indicated that it really kind of changed the role of like the principal and the assistant principal. What did that accountability do to their role and how did that really impact students' lives? Well, one, it allowed those administrators to really focus on what the students needed instructionally. So at one point, it was Students get an opportunity to go to high school, you graduate, and you go to college, the military, or you go to the workforce, right? Students kind of had their pathways charted even when they're little. You know, it depends on your families, the opportunities. So I think this role allowed all our administrators to look at data and to really see who's performing, who's not performing in school. We have some high performers and those students can go to college. I mean, I believe students who go to college, military, or the workforce, but our job is to make sure they're prepared and it's their choice. But it really allowed also administrators to help and support teachers. We have to support our teachers. That's where the magic is happening. The magic is not happening in the hallway. Oh, uh, hallways. The magic is happening in the classroom with teachers and teachers needed additional instructional supports. And administrators can't help if you don't, if you go in a classroom, you don't know what's teaching. You don't know what good pedagogy is. So it's very important that administrators know what good teaching looks like and know how to assist those teachers if they need some additional support. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's one of the ones, accountability. Some people are like, I don't want to be accountable, but you know, we have to have those accountability measures. So we can make sure students have the supports that they need. You approach that from a different way. I think Bob kind of alluded to this earlier, right? Is that oftentimes when you hear accountability, it's filled with negativity and it's filled with sort of like frustrations about unfunded mandates and all that kind of stuff. But you gave it a really good spin. (laughs) And I think (laughs) I think that there's value in that. And I appreciate you kind of covering some of the challenges associated with that, as well as those valuable and necessary benefits. We want to make sure everyone is accountable for everything that we do. So, for example, when we look at athletics, right, and you hire a coach to win, you know, you hire a coach to make sure that students know the skills to play basketball or football. I know I was a principal at Brookhaven High School. They won the state championship, I think, in 2003 or four. I don't remember which year. But those coaches prepared the students, right? That's accountability. How do you know? You got students that are coming on the team, they're trying out, you're getting the best, you want to make sure they're winning, right? But also with that, the coaches want to make sure that students have the scholarships, they have good grades, they're eligible to play. You know, all of that, I think, is part of accountability. You just don't play the sport, but you also have to be a student and a scholar athlete. It's the same thing for students. You know, we want students reading by third grade. Well, what's happening if they're in the fifth grade and they can't read? Well, do we have the resources to support in first grade and second grade? So I think accountability is good. It ensures that all students, regardless of their background, they have the supports that's needed so that they can be successful. And those supports should come from the district to support the teacher. 
who was doing all the magic in the classroom. I just want to defend the principals at South High School in the 1980s. They seemed to hold me <laughs> plenty accountable for skipping classes. Way to go, principal. <laughs> they didn't catch me every time, that's for sure. But more than I wanted to be taught. So there was some accountability back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's just like, yeah, I bet you cut class. Yeah, um, <laughs> I did. I did indeed. I was one of those students who was shockingly kind of indifferent to authority. Okay, so I'm going to take it back in the Wayback Machine here a little bit again. So, I mean, Alex was old for this conversation, but I was back when I was young. So what I said earlier that I've been going to board meetings for like 20 years, and I have been, and I'd go to board meetings to present on our solution, like what we're doing in technology, how we're improving schools. You know, technology was a big deal in the early 2000s. It was starting to boom. And I still go to those board meetings, but it's different now. I mean, that's what I see. I don't sit in a big chair like you did, Talisa. I can't even imagine. It's a rough deal from where I sit to be there. But I've seen it change. The community, the parents, the boards. Fortunately, I don't sit in that seat. But from the seat that you occupied for so long, what's changed and why? This is a great question. And a few things have changed. When we think about boards from years ago, we think about why did those boards exist? They were governing bodies, right? They wanted to make sure that you had appropriate expenditures, that students were learning. We had new buildings. Those were the things that were really concerning of school boards. And you had school board members. Remember, these are community members who really want their public schools to be stellar schools for their students and for their friends' students. A community, in many ways, is defined by how great their schools are. And so you have community members who really want to make sure that we have good schools, regardless of the community. And some communities have more resources than others, depending on who's living in those communities. So when you have communities that are high poverty or high wealth, the challenges of those board members to get things done and managed may be a little different. And what I mean by that, the legislative part, because board members, their job is to govern, to make sure that there are good systems in the school district. What has seemed to happen in the last 10 to 15 years, especially the last 10 years and, and more recent, the last five years, is that board members have really become more involved in the political aspect of what's happening in communities. And I think those political voices of the individual board members, people have defined that as the voice of the entire board. But I think people should understand that an individual member doesn't make the decision for the board. The board is the collective membership. So Alex, you can be a board member in your community. Bob, you can be a board member in your community. And I can be one. But we're not the board unless we are the collective. So I think late of late, we have seen the political pressure, political frustration. We've seen things that are happening in communities that people don't want as part of their school systems. And people have voiced those concerns individually in a very different way that they haven't in years past. And so communities are having now to manage that. You know, how do we manage the voices of our community when they're talking to individuals that have a different belief about what should be happening in our schools. When you mention that it's sort of individual voices not speaking for the board, I understand that because I see people sort of speaking as though they represent the entire organization all the time. And I mean, heck, even superintendents are not immune to that, right? But I think the challenge that I've seen in our local community, now we've actually got a board election coming up here on the next Tuesday. But in the previous election two years ago, we had 10 candidates running for three spots. I mean, usually I'm used to seeing communities beg for people to run for school board. And it wasn't a position that was in high demand. And over $150,000 of dark money from outside funders came to fund a slate of three candidates who ultimately won in, you know, $150,000 for a school board election. Like, that's incredible. So it's a 
different sort of thing. The other thing too, go to the other side, is the board members in our community are having incredibly long meetings because what's happening is in the public commentary period, we've got political parties that are actually recruiting people to come and speak. And as soon as one side finds out that the other side is recruiting, they get more people. And our meetings are always over full and you have to watch them on like Microsoft Teams because you can't get in. And people start recruiting people to speak on various topics like weeks in advance. This is not like your father's school board meeting where it was concerned local citizens and you had to like beg somebody to to be that concerned about the school board to do this to now hundreds, literally hundreds of people at every school board meeting, sometimes even shouting about what's happening in schools. I know this is happening across the country. Have you experienced this change? And how do you manage that as a superintendent? Well, one, just remember, people who are running for school boards are community members who really want the best for their students, for the students that are served at that school. I don't doubt that. But there are very, very differing opinions on what that means. Exactly, of what that means. So when you see that you have more people that want to be involved in schools and the school board, I think that's a good thing. Because years ago, I mean, you can see school board meetings and there'd be like 30 minutes, right? And you're thinking, what did they do? They approved teacher hiring and there was a building facility plan and that was it. I think now we're seeing that the community wants to know more about the operational aspects of schools, especially in Ohio, when there are being the tax levies are determining, people are realizing, oh my gosh, I'm paying for that school district. You know, that's my tax dollars are paying. So what is actually happening and can I question what is happening? So I think that's a good thing that people have, you know, they want to know more about what's happening in schools. They want to know where their tax dollars are going. I think when we push over into areas that are not governing is when you have that pool. You hire school districts, hire superintendents as their CEOs. And in Ohio, you also have your treasurer. So in Ohio, you have two direct reports, your treasurer and your superintendent. They're managing the day-to-day. The board is the governing body. So it's that gray area. It's that gray area. So it's great that we have these people that are concerned about their schools and actively involving. Where the concern comes in, as I'm hearing it from you, is where board members whose job is governance start to become more involved in the operation side, which is really the purview and the responsibility of the superintendent. Superintendent, yeah. And where the magic is, is when you find communities in which the board and the superintendent work hand in hand. And that's really what it becomes. You know, you see a lot of things that are moving forward, a lot of legislation that is moving forward. You have board training, board governance training. We did a lot of that in Columbus City Schools through, we did some training at Harvard. We also did training through our our Council of Great City Schools. They even had an Ohio school board. But that's where the tension, when those lines are blurred, it becomes murky. Kalisa, I am so happy to hear you speak positively of all of this involvement, because I've heard lots of negative about people who want to disrupt board meetings or people who want their way and they're yelling. And I am so happy to hear an administrator who says, I welcome your input. This is your school, too. And we need to hear all voices. now." It seems that we only hear voices far to the left or far to the right or the extreme voices are the ones who go out. But it's nice to hear that you want to hear them. You know, I was at those board meetings, right, where it was five board members, whoever was presenting the student of the month and their parents. And that was it. We're all done. Nobody else showed up. So I'm so glad to hear that. Well, the other part, too, is just for our listeners. Remember, I said she's retired, so she's not covering her butt to not have to get in trouble with her. (laughs) <laughs> right. And so, you know what? And I won't say to our listeners, I think the pandemic, it kind of emboldened, I think, in a sense, of some board members because the world was shut. People were pushing for their kids to go back to school and they were questioning why. Some communities were back in school and some communities' schools were not in session. 
So people began to question and kind of peel that onion. What's really happening in his schools? So I think you have to welcome those conversations. Now, they shouldn't be nasty and mean and yelling and screaming. I think those, to your point, Bob, those are extreme. And I think that's disappointing because kids are watching that, right? Our students are watching those board meetings. You know, our community is watching. And I really think we have to be careful what we're portraying to our students, our young people, because we want them to emulate that positive side, but still be inquisitive. Now, we don't we want them to question. We want them to be critical thinkers. But we as adults, I think we have to be more mindful of our behaviors when we have those tension, that those tense moments in trying to make the best decisions for our students in our community. That's awesome. Our listeners and Bob certainly heard me talk about this. I love community partnerships, right? And the whole lens through which you are evaluating board relationships is all really about community partnerships. And that's kind of a hallmark, really, of your career. One of the reasons why we really wanted to have you on the show. And so share with us a little bit about, like you were part of the team with Steam Rising, which was a partnership between City of Columbus, Ohio State University, Columbia State Community College. And you've done several significant community partnerships. Talk to us a little bit about some of those initiatives and the impact that they've really had on the school and on the community where, where really there's sort of mutual benefit. Well, first, I would like to say partnerships, in my opinion, are the key to success for schools and school districts. And one thing we've learned, if I've learned even over the past 28 years, is that if schools aren't partnering with their community, you're less likely you're not going to be successful. It's going to be very hard to be successful. You really have to embrace and partner with your community. It could be a sister school. It could be the school district. It could be college and universities, but you have to partner. One of the things when in Columbus, it even started with our strategic plan. I partnered with the organization called Patel for Kids. And they say, really wanted them to help us pull the community together to decide what are our hopes and dreams and aspirations for our students. Because when you can do that work together, then who is responsible for the success? not just the school district, all of those communities, it's everybody. So it's have to have everybody join in the conversation. And so everybody has some skin in the game. So we started with our strategic planning, then with steam rising. Never forget, I had a conversation with the former president, Christina Johnson. And we said, you know what? We're the largest school district and you're the largest university. How can we partner in a way that will benefit kids but not a program for kids. And what Steve Rising did, it gave us the opportunities to train teachers. If we want to have, you know, better scientists, mathematicians, what's happening in college and what do our teachers need to know more of and who not better to learn that information is from these wonderful professors at The Ohio State University. So J.P. Morgan Chase and the city, they all came together and our teachers were on the campus of the Ohio State for the last two summers. It was absolutely wonderful. But again, that is an example of the power of partnerships. If you're very intentional, you both have goals aligned, you are holding one another accountable for the results of the partnership, my gosh you can do the unimaginable. And so that piece to me is so important. So that's what happened with steam rising and it's, it's still moving forward. Look at you going full circle on the whole like accountability thing and everything. Like and you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to draw another circle here. So. Well, you know, because real quick, sometimes what happens is, let's say Alex or Bob and I, you know, say, hey guys, we're going to join a partnership. And then Bob doesn't do his job. And then Talisa and Alex. There we Alex, go. Talisa's picking on me. You know, <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, wait. What a hypothetical there. Holy moly. Talisa <laughs> knows me so well. Bob's on 200. Yeah. Right. And we're sitting here like, oh my gosh, we have to get it done. Well, where's Bob? Well, we're going to forget about Bob. We're going to move forward. Or then it fails. And then, That's you know, actually pretty normal. 
Alaska. Oh, but that's not good. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, that that was out loud, Alec. That was out loud again. <laughs> yes, but you know, but I think it's important is that a true partnership really holds everybody, everyone accountable for his or her part, right? Because the benefit of the partnership is to help teachers, students, to help the system improve. And when you see what you did help the system improve, oh my gosh, and you held each other accountable for something that didn't happen or did, that's the power of the partnerships. And when you do that over and over, you do that well, you get the results that you intended to get. I think. First, I'd like to apologize for Alex's outburst. He has impulse control issues. <laughs> unlike me, who's very focused. But I tell you another another partnership we did was the Columbus Promise. That's what so, I was gonna ask about. She's reading my mind. Yes. Yeah, reading your mind. <laughs> okay, okay, wait, let me set you up. Like it's so I'm doing my job here in our partnership. Yes, yes, yes. The Columbus yes. Promise. Please, please, somebody hold Bob accountable. <laughs> Six hundred <laughs> students go to college tuition free in the Columbus Promise program. Tell us about it, like brag about it. First, I have to give all, I mean, kudos to Council President Shannon Harding. Right before the pandemic, he and his team came to me and said, Talisa, we want to be able to find a way for students in Columbus City Schools to go to college, to wish free, to go to Columbus State. And we have this idea. They've been looking at other Promise programs across the United States, and I was familiar with a couple of them in Michigan because I had served four years in Saginaw, Michigan. It was so funny. In Michigan, you either go blue or you go green, right? I said, no, there's no AD Ohio State. It's so funny. And so I said, you know what? What do you need for Columbus City Schools to do? We will do it. Because if we can create a pathway and remove the barriers for students to have access to a two-year degree, and then go on to a four-year degree, I'm all in. And he and his team, and we all joined together with some other partners and were able to get up to 600 students at Columbus State. And it has been wonderful. Was, you know, many students are like, is this for real? Was this a one-year thing or is this recurring? Oh, yeah. They were going into their second year. Because we have the second cohort now. So will it be roughly that same number every year? Well, we hope it's more. Because we want as many students, you know, some students go to four-year institutions. You know, a lot of students want to go to the Ohio State University, but it's so large. Many students, they don't get in or they go to the satellite campus. But we're saying when we think about workforce development and other opportunities for students, go to Columbus State. They have some good programs. They partner with some good industries that will really get students to industry, their credentials. They can work while they go to school. And it's really a game changer for students and their families. You know, for many students, instead of students that are first generation college students, it's really changing the life of their families. And this Promise Scholarship really, and now there's accountability with that because Columbus City Schools have to make sure students are prepared. We have to make sure they graduate. We have to make sure they fill out their finance, their FAFSA forms. I mean, so there is accountability because when we don't do our part, then students don't get those opportunities. So accountability, again, plays in that. But that's another partnership that has taken off and really done well for our kids. That's really awesome. All right. So we started asking this of all of our guests. I say all of this. This is only the second time, Bob, third time. Well, it outnumbers our listeners. So. Okay. Right, right. Number first time to be asked. Our guests outnumber our listeners on this show. <laughs> so, Delisa, tell us when you were a student, who was your favorite teacher and why? Wow. So, you know what? When I was thinking about what would I say, I would say this kind of twofold. So, one, my favorite teachers, and I say two, were my mom and dad because they were both teachers. And they made sure, this is so funny. They did not send us to the schools where they taught. They sent us to a different school, the neighboring school district, because they didn't want us to have that pressure. It was so interesting. But we didn't appreciate them until later on. So I think my favorite teacher with two was Mr. Thomas Wallace and Mr. Sam Higdon. 
there were my English teachers and my math teachers in fourth grade. And they taught side by side. So all the girls in the fourth grade were so glad we got Mr. Hager and Mr. Wallace. You know, I think it was their hormones in fourth and fifth grade. But they were so passionate and patient with all learners because I was a talker and I really didn't focus a lot in school. You know, they always said, Talisa, no matter where I was a kid, no matter where you move me to, I always talk to that kid. So uh (laughs) I was very social, very social. But always, I think Mr. Higdon and Mr. Wallace were just so instrumental to the point that Mr. Higdon is is now Dr. Higdon, became the superintendent of the school district that my dad retired as an administrator from. And Mr. Wallace, who's now Dr. Wallace, hired me in the admissions office at Miss University of Mississippi, which is my hometown. Once I graduated from college, I had a summer job at the university and Dr. Wallace hired me. Got it. So the reason he's your favorite is because he gave you money. <laughs> Got it. I didn't know. Now we're all coming together. It's all coming together. Yeah. So Alex, did you sit next to Talisa? Because I could see the two of you talking in class. Now, I mean, not actually see it because I was cutting class. So I wouldn't have been there to see you talking. But you know what, Bob? I would say this. In all those, you know, there are teachers that are listening, administrators listening. It's so hard when you're a kids of teachers. It really is. Because people always have these expectations of you as a learner, right? And my older brother was so smart. Everyone thought I was going to be the smartest, Thomas. But I think what Mr. Higdon and Mr. Wallace did, they saw me as the individual Talisa. They didn't compare me to my older brother because they didn't have him as a student. And so I think for the first time in the fourth grade, I saw that I could be me. And I didn't have that shadow of my older brother and they saw my potential and then hold those other expectations over my head. So let up from your kids a little bit. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> <on> t- <laughs> Delisa, our introduction for you included the word powerhouse and I think you nailed it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, we at this point ask, first of all, I'll let you in on a secret. Alex and I have a little bet as to whether you knew who your favorite teachers were or not. I think this is a draw, Alex, because her parents, come on, she knew that from the beginning. So we'll carry it on to the next one. We'll carry it. We have a little wager. Call it a draw. Right now. I'm still up by one. Yeah. Right now I'm losing. That's right. That's right. So future (laughs) podcast guests, think of who your favorite teacher is and be prepared. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So we have talked about boards and you talked about the work you did with your boards to educate them and to get them to understand their role, your role, where you needed the help. You've talked about the STEAM initiative. That's a great community partnership for teachers to help them. And of course, the Columbus Promise. Can you point us to a few resources so that if our listeners, both of them, are inspired to follow your lead, where can they learn more about what you did or what they can do? There's really more. It's amazing to me, but people actually listen to this. I think one thing as we talk about ed tech, there's a called Utopia, Edutopia. Edutopia, yeah. Oh my gosh. They have so many wonderful resources for parents. I mean, because technology is changing the game. When we think about AI and all of these, I mean, personalized education, that's going to be another game changer. You know, many people believe they don't need teachers. You can really set up you know, Alex, I can set up a program and put you on the computer, put Bob on the other end, and to visualize these programs. And students are doing well that. So I think Edutopia, to me, has so many different resources. And then also for our parents, PTA. Go to your PTA, Parent Teacher Association website. They have so many great resources for parents. I mean, uh, just your teaching references, how to help your student references, funding. I mean, there's so many places that parents can be educated. I think those are two good resources I would definitely recommend. That's great. And it so speaks to those two resources, particularly the PTA, speaks to your commitment to the community and really approaching education of our community as a community initiative. And so, Delisa, this was great. 
I swear we did not prep her to be so tight and consistent in all of her storytelling, but that was amazing and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, this has been great. It's all that time I'm just spending doing the retirement and, you know, I get kind of just thinking about and pulling this stuff together and it's, it's all been good. Thank you so much. We'll save this question for the next time you're on, but I really wanted to know what's retirement like? Because it looks pretty groovy from here and I'd like to give it a try <laughs> soon. Oh my gosh. We'll handle those questions and more. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk about that later. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. A giant smile on her face tells the story. <laughs> yeah, that it does. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Dixon, for all your time and wisdom. This was great. Until the next show, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Wow, Bob, that was a ton of fun. I mean, they all are, but you and I talked about kind of a concern about asking her about boards because boards are kind of a downer right now in America. And she brought such a sense of affirmation and optimism to the whole discussion. It was really very inspiring for me. It was a breath of fresh air to hear an administrator who is unchained from having to play the political game now even, still saying that she wants to hear everybody's voice, whether she agrees with it or not. And I'm sure you, I, anybody can go to a board meeting, hear voices, and I'm sure we would disagree with somebody making comments. And yet she wants to hear it all. And man, I'm so happy for her to be retired. She's earned it. I don't know if she's got enough room on a resume for one more accomplishment, but it makes me a little sad. You know, are there other leaders to take her place that are that I don't know, optimistic and intelligent? And man, you could hang your hat on either the STEAM initiative or the Columbus Promise, and that would be a career defining. And she's got two of them and they're still going. It's just amazing. Well, and I mentioned this at the end of how consistent her answers were in terms of like accountability and listening and all being sort of part of the solution. And that's just something that we all need more of. And I think, Bob, that part of the reason she was able to say those things, despite the fact that she is, like you said, unchained, right? Because she's retired, is that demonstrates a level of sort of comfort and self-confidence. When you've got that confidence and you feel that support, you can welcome ideas that are contrary to yours and create that space for it without bias. We need more of that, I think, in our schools. That was wonderful. For people who are listening to this and not watching, she smiled the whole time she talked to us. She was smiling as big talking about boards and embracing those voices as she was when she was talking about 600 students going to college for free. It was invigorating to see her. And I, I want people to understand just how it was even better to see her that way. Yeah, it really was. It was just fantastic. We're going to have a tough time beating that show, I think, Bob, but I look forward to the next one with you, my friend. Until next time, Alex. Learning Through Technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast is brought to you by STS Education, a Pacific One Source company. To learn more about how educators can leverage technology to drive successful educational outcomes, check us out at www.stsed.com. Connect with us by searching for Learning Through Technology in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else podcasts are found. And click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. On behalf of the team at STS Education, thanks for joining us.